Bet Night. It's us again, John Deeks and Marianne Van Dorsler, and uh, I've got a special feeling tonight, Marianne. What, for me? No, 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 I think our numbers might come up. <laughs> oh, well, let's hope so, and I hope yours do too. Let's introduce our officials, Valerie, Rex and Tony. Welcome, and let's go to Super 66 straight away. $611,171.34. Now I've got a bit of a, a bit of a twitch. A bit of an intuition. Ooh. Here we go with our super numbers. We start off with number five, followed by three, seven, six. Oh, we do not have, we have a, a misdraw. There. And a one. So what we'll have to do now is refer to our la official la and uh, la do la another a draw and a draw. Oh my little so, uh, uh, star sweeper. In number five, I told you I had a really I'll good sweep the star so down. Uh, Tennis official, you. And the government official, and uh, all the balls under government, la la under the government supervision. La la and uh, first of all, they will check the little them. Soft and the numbers are lucky sleepers. Just need that one more. Here comes right. a pink so, cloud. Not the 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 so, the 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 Our fifth number la, la, to, uh, to be drawn. So the officials have done all that, blocked off all but one commandment. So la, la, let's draw it now and see which number does come out. There now, little star sweep. Dream on. And it's number five. So five, three, seven, six, five. And that last number was, I believe, number one. That we will check. Paul Brereton, the Assistant Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force, found that the commanders of the Joint Task Force 633 did not have operational command and as such were not accountable for the deeds of their subordinates. Yeah, uh, Karen? Uh, General, you were the commander of Task Force 633 in um, the Middle East in 2011. I wonder, as you read this report, what were your reflections in that context? And what do you say to people who might suggest that it lets people like you off the hook? I don't think it lets anyone off the hook. The inquiry sees the command responsibility of Commander JTF-633 in a different light to that of Commanding Officer SOTG for a number of reasons. First, JTF-633 was not positioned, organisationally or geographically, to influence and control SOTG operations. Its national command function did not include operational command. While those who had operational command are rightly held responsible and accountable for the deeds of their subordinates, the principle that informs that is that ultimately they command and control what happens under their command. Without operational command, JTF-633 did not have the degree of command and control over SOTG on which command responsibility depends. The previous film in this series established evidence that JTF-633 commanders did in fact have operational command. That evidence included a chapter of the book, Niche Wars, written by Michael Crane on command and control and his associated presentation. A chapter in the same book written by Dan McDaniel on Australia's intervention in Afghanistan. A response by Angus Campbell to questions by the Senate Foreign Affairs. Defence and Trade Legislation Committee. I held what is known as National Command and Operational Command of Australian forces deployed to the Middle East region of operations during my tenure in command. A paper by Major General Andrew Hocking and an associated presentation on it. Since that film, further evidence of the commanders of the Joint Task Force having operational command has been uncovered. Stuart Smith took command of Joint Task Force 633 from January to October 2012. He was awarded a Distinguished Service Cross for his time in command. His citation states, Major General Smith's professional leadership and insightful operational command of Joint Task Force 633 ensured that Australia's national interests in the maritime regions of the Arabian Gulf, Arabian Sea and Red Sea were protected. 
that Australia's deployed air and land forces in the Middle East were supported and operated effectively, and that Australia's goals in Uruzgan province, Afghanistan, were achieved. Smith's citation is further evidence that the commanders of Joint Task Force 633 had operational command, contrary to the findings of the Brereton report. The citation for Angus Campbell's Distinguished Service Cross states, Major General Angus John Campbell exercised operational command of a joint task force that, while mainly focused on Afghanistan, maintained an enduring maritime security presence, secured the Australian mission in Baghdad, and fulfilled increased international engagement with a wide range of regional nations. Through his visits and continuous engagement, Major General Campbell's exercise of operational command ensured that Australian national expectations were met, that Australian forces were supported and operated effectively, and that benefits to Afghan society in Uruzgan province were delivered... In October 2023, Senator Malcolm Roberts questioned Campbell as to whether he had operational command whilst he was the commander of Joint Task Force 633. Getting on to matters of operational command and... and uh... General Campbell, do you still maintain that as commander of the Joint Task Force 633, you did not have operational command of forces in Afghanistan? No, Senator, um, that's quite the reverse. Uh, I had, in my tenure, national command and operational command. They are technical t uh, terms of command, and that's exactly what I had. So you had command over the Afghanistan uh, operation? I had national command and operational command of personnel uh, in the Middle East, Senator. So then doesn't that make you um, complicit in the, in the uh, Burton Report's accusations? Because you were the senior officer overseeing the people who allegedly performed those acts. Senator, can you just ask that question again? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Well, the Burton report uh, was damning about some events in Afghanistan, as I understand it. Is that correct? Uh, yes, in terms of uh, uh, credible information of allegations of unlawful conduct. That's, that's right. correct, Senator. Thank yeah. you. So let's go to your nomination for the Distinguished Service Cross. That's provided in Defence Freedom of Information 544-22-23, document 8. I'll quote from your nomination. Quote, General Angus John Campbell exercised operational command of a joint task force mainly focused on Afghanistan. And through his visits and continuous engagement, Major General Campbell's exercise of operational command ensured that Australian national expectations were met, that Australian forces were supported and operated effectively, end of quote. So your exercise of operational command is referenced twice in the nomination for the bars you're wearing on your chest right now. But you claim earlier on when, when, you had, uh, when it came to the war crimes allegations that you did not have operational command. Is that correct or am I misunderstanding something? There seems uh, to be a contradiction. So, so Senator, t t if you're talking about today and any other day I can remember, it's very, very clear the Chief of Joint Operations of the day assigned me national command and operational command for the tenure of my appointment as Commander Joint Task Force 633 from the 14th of January 2011 to the 17th of January 2012. Uh, so there has never been a moment when I don't uh, suggest that I had national command and operational command. Why is Angus Campbell confident that in his previous role as Commander of Joint Task Force 633 in 2011, he is not accountable or responsible for alleged war crimes committed under his command. It is because in his current role as Chief of Defence, he is responsible for deciding who in the chain of command should be held accountable. In delivering on the recommendation, the, the particular recommendation of the Burton Inquiry, uh, I was uh, required to consider across the period 2005 to 2016, which is the time frame of the inquiry, circumstances in which command accountability might arise uh, for uh, alleg multiple allegations, critical information of unlawful conduct. And I have, as I say, done my part in that process 
and uh, offered materials and advice to the Deputy Prime Minister. This clear conflict of interest was the subject of detailed questioning by Senator Shoebridge. Given that some of the review will be in relation to senior personnel, and I think that includes yourself, um, General Campbell, um, I think there is a reasonable basis for you to tell us who undertook the review. And so, yes, can you tell us who undertook the review? Senator, I undertook the review. All right. It and is, it is, Senator, it is a uniquely particular circumstance in which, as the commander of the Australian Defence Force and looking at the question of command accountability, uh, I am the authority to undertake that review. But I'm, I'm having difficulty understanding how you can review yourself, though, and, and, and perhaps you could help by identifying how you've dealt with that conflict mm. of interest and whether or not you considered having that aspect of the review undertaken by a separate officer? So I think that um, the useful uh, part of this to, to, to recognise is there, there is, as described, that three-step process, myself, the Deputy Prime Minister, ultimately the Governor-General. And if the Deputy Prime Minister were to regard uh, my considerations inadequate, inconsistent or uh, self-interested, uh, then the Deputy Prime Minister is actually the decision-making level. So mm -hmm. he has access to all of my considerations. And if he were to uh, regard them as insufficient or um, not sufficiently broad or uh, uh, not encompassing uh, any that should, then uh, he could uh, he could ensure that they did. Um, well, he may form that view yes. one way or another, and I'm not sure. asking you to speculate on what the Defence Minister will do, but I'm asking you to deal with the fact that yeah. how did you confront the fact that there was a, a very obvious conflict of interest? Sure. I mean, if I was allowed, mm -hmm. if I say to my kids they can mark their own homework, yeah. um, you know, they're very ethical children. I'm sure they do a very good job. Mm -hmm. But you could see the conflict of interest there. And you were basically marking your own homework. Yes, yeah, so, Senator, I, I, I get it, Senator. I could see the, the, uh, the perception of the conflict of interest. Um, but having uh, read the complete Brereton report, uh, I felt that this could be done by me and it could then be considered... Uh, comprehensively by the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, now, now, there are many other circumstances, having read that report, that I would not think that, but in this particular circumstance, that was the conclusion I drew. Did you think about getting, or did you get, any probity advice for that? Did you seek legal advice or other probity advice? No, I didn't, Senator. You, you don't think that would have just been a, a really sensible integrity measure, given you were basically reviewing yourself? Uh, the challenge in that, Senator, is uh, to who would I refer? Well, As in, to who would I refer to review me, if not me, and then the Deputy Prime Minister? Well, you could pick a variety of very senior um, members of the Defence Force who, um, perhaps from another service, and you could... Um, you could put in place measures to protect them if they undertook that review. I mean, that seems a very obvious initial step. So I, I think that is very, it's a very reasonable <coughs> idea to propose, Senator, but it suffers from the reality that they are all under my command and uh, that arrangement would itself suffer from the perception that their recommendation was implicitly because of an outcome that I sought. Well, what about a former CDF? Yeah. You could, you could um, obviously get a former CDF yeah. or the Inspector General. I mean, there are, there are so many other potential options. Um, so the Inspector General, uh, this, isn't, um, this isn't a military justice issue, so it's not appropriate for the Inspector General. Uh, and uh, I did consider whether 
Uh, I might refer myself to some of my predecessors, mm. uh, but quite frankly, uh, with the level of emotion and um, uh, and unintentional and also intentional disinformation about this issue, I quite frankly didn't want to give them that pain. What you see, General Campbell, I, I can see how you, this, this issue is very, is very close to you and close to the organisation. And there's a, there's a lot of emotions about it and very real yep. concerns about it. And I, I have my own views about it, but I'm not going to sure. engage in that now. Um, but you're left with this situation now, aren't you, where you, unless the conclusion is yep. to withdraw your honours and yep. withdraw the medals, uh. there's going to be this irremedial question mark about a conflict of interest over the whole process. It, uh, so, Senator, um, <clears throat> I think that that would be true uh, if the circumstance of the review was not the question of to review the appropriateness of awards to certain command, uh, commanders in certain periods of time in which Justice Burton found credible information of multiple uh, allegations of unlawful killing. Um, is it open to the Deputy Prime Minister, and, and you may not be the one to answer this, General Campbell, it may be you, Minister. Is it open to the Deputy Prime Minister to refer this off to a third party um, to review that aspect involving General Campbell? No, it definitely is. Uh, it, the, the Deputy Prime Minister is open to seek any advice or uh, referential consideration that he wishes. And indeed, I gave evidence before, I think, in answer to questions from another senator about uh, the information I have about the Deputy Prime Minister. He's received the recommendations from the CDF recently. He is considering that and will seek any necessary advice. Seeking advice? Will seek any necessary advice. All right. And so, you, Senator, I can assure you, although I appreciate that you would wish an independent assurance, that um, this has been done in meticulous consistency. <clears throat> and the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, I, I have encouraged that he seek uh, uh, independent views. Um, and, and I understand what you're saying, that it will never satisfy, but that's the way I have done it. This is from a briefing paper by the ADF to the Minister of Defence. Under the heading, What were command arrangements for Afghanistan? The document states, Throughout SOTG Task Force 66 Rotations 4 to 20, from 2007 to 2013, command authorities remained relatively unchanged. Operational control was held by the CJTF 633 for rotations 4 to 14 until 2011, then transitioned to Commander International Security Assistance Force Special Operations Forces for rotations 15 to 20 until 2013. During the period of COM isaf sof operational control, CJTF 633 assumed operational command. These briefing notes are evidence that the Commander of Joint Task Force 633 had operational command over the Special Operations Task Group from 2011 to 2013. Importantly, the notes reveal that the commander of Joint Task Force 633 had even closer and more control over the Special Operations Task Group in the form of operational control from 2007 to 2011. This is at direct odds with Brereton's finding that SOTG was under the operational command of ISAF-SOF and that SOTG was outside of the JTF 633 operational command chain. This table summarises the information on command roles and dates from Hawking's paper and Defence's ministerial briefing notes. The table shows the hierarchy of command and control relevant to the Special Operations Task Group in Afghanistan from 2007 to 2013. The higher levels of command and control are at the top of the table, working down to the lower levels of command and control at the bottom. At all relevant times, the commander of Joint Task Force 633 held the national command role. The commander of JTF 633 also held the operational command role, contrary to the findings of the Brereton report. 
the tactical command role was not assigned and is noted as not applicable in Hawking's paper. The ministerial briefing notes state that operational control was assigned to the commander of Joint Task Force 633 from 2007 to 2011, and then transferred to the Commander International Security Assistance Forces Special Operations Forces from 2011 to 2013. It is clear from Defence's own briefing notes that during a critically important period, the commander of JTF 633 had operational control of SOTG. Operational control is a more direct level of control over forces than operational command. From 2011, operational control of SOTG was handed to Com I Saf Sof. We will address this role shortly. Not only is Brereton wrong in concluding that the commander of JTF 633 did not have operational command, he does not acknowledge that CJTF 633 had more direct operational control over SOTG. By omitting these details, and instead stating that SOTG was under the command and control of ISAF SOF, Brereton attempts to shift any responsibility and accountability to those commanding that coalition, and away from the commanders of Joint Task Force 633. The Brereton Report and Hawking's paper state that at certain times, the Australian Special Operations Task Group was under the operational command and control of the Commander of the International Security and Assistance Forces Special Operations Force. The International Security Assistance Force, known as ISAF, was established at the Bonn Conference in 2001 after the fall of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The change because now we stay more... But what is ISAF and how are its activities structured? ISAF spokesman Mark Leighty. It's a NATO-led military coalition. The 26 members of NATO another 14 members from other countries, 40 nations, all working together to try and improve security in Afghanistan. NATO assumed command of ISAF in 2003 and, since then, has expanded the alliance's mission to cover the whole of Afghanistan. NATO is leading some 43,000 troops, providing support to the Afghan authorities. ISAF is structured into five regional commands, covering the north, led by Germany, the East, led by the United States of America, the West, led by Italy, and the Southern Command, which is rotated between Britain, Canada and the Netherlands. There is also a separate command for the capital Kabul, rotated between France, Italy and Turkey. So why is such an approach needed in a country like Afghanistan? Afghanistan is a big country. Um, from the bottom left to the top right is a distance from Paris to Warsaw. So you need to split the country up into portions so each regional command has got a manageable bite and each regional command has got a brigadier or a major general in charge of it and then they have separate forces underneath them so according to the amount of activity there is the size of the force increases so for instance in the south they've got over 19,000 troops and that's where the most fighting is in the east, it's almost the same size, and that's because there's a lot of fighting there. The north, which is the safest area, um, where the most development is happening, relatively small. The west, somewhere in between. And then, of course, lastly, is the capital. And in the capital area, it's small geographically. ISAF SOF was the special operations element of ISAF. Each NATO country operated in different regions. The Australian Special Operations Task Group operated in the southern region, mainly in Uruzgan province. It was given the designation Task Force 66. There were lots of reasons um, uh, to be positive uh, about this year. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, we, we are in the north of Afghanistan at the moment and I have visited the west where the situation is relatively under control and certainly there isn't very much insurgency. In the east, although there has been a, a recent upsurge of violence post the winter, it is still relatively quiet in comparison to previous years. And there are signs of some real momentum in the east and especially in coordination with the Pakistanis on the eastern border. Clearly in the south there are still problems. Uh, we describe the south as a stalemate. 
That is not in any sense uh, a reflection uh, on the excellent work that is being done by those international forces that are in the south in fighting the insurgency. But the simple fact of the matter is that we don't have sufficient capacity down in the south to be able to widen and deepen security to allow those other lines of operation of governance and development to come in and, and have full effect. The Brereton report tries to give the impression that ISAFSOF was totally removed from the Australian hierarchy and chain of command. The impression given is that the Australian Special Operations Task Group was hidden, isolated and disconnected from any Australian command or control. That segregation is the key reason given by Brereton as to why no one in the Australian chain of command knew or should have known about the allegations of war crimes and why no senior commanders should be held accountable. The increasing propensity of the Special Operations Task Group, SOTG, to endeavour to conduct missions against targets in the absence of actionable intelligence was a significant manifestation of the excessive autonomy of the SOTG, its deviation from the national mission and the lack of sufficient national oversight arising from the complicated command and control arrangements by which the SOTG was under operational control of the International Security Assistance Force, Special Operations Force. If the SOTG was under the operational command and control of the commanders of ISAF-SOF, who were they? The inaugural commander of ISAF-SOF was appointed in January 2008. He was an Australian officer. His name is Rick Burr. Burr went on to work his way up through the ranks of the Australian Army and retired from his position as Chief of Army in 2022. He now runs a consulting firm, the Burr Initiative. This is Rick Burr speaking to Nick McKenzie in a 60 Minutes interview. You talk about accountability. In 2008, you were a very high-ranking officer in Afghanistan. Did you hear any whispers from partner forces, from Afghans on the ground, from anyone under or in your command of war crimes? I heard nothing of uh, these allegations. If I had have, uh, I absolutely uh, would have reported them. Uh, this, uh, this is shocking uh, now uh, that uh, as we look back over our history, many commanders at many levels are asking, how did this happen? Lots of Australians, lots of diggers, uh, incredulous at the suggestion in the report and what you've just made now that officers did not know. The inquiry report makes very clear uh, the efforts that uh, individuals went to to uh, conceive, uh, conduct and conceal uh, these uh, alleged unlawful acts. Isn't it the job of officers to know what's going on the ground? And, and if our leaders didn't know, what does that say about their leadership? Leaders at every level uh, are asking themselves these very questions to now discover that they were lied to, that the truth was withheld from uh, their own uh, commanders. It is truly uh, 
devastating. It is morally destructive that this behaviour went on in our own organisation. The Army Chief, like the Defence Chief, won't be drawn on why senior officers are yet to face any disciplinary action over their failings in Afghanistan. But the Prime Minister's making it clear he expects the top brass to be held accountable, not just rogue soldiers who did the wrong thing on the front lines. Those who had responsibilities and accountabilities in that chain of command and that's what I expect to be done. The blunt warning prompting awkward questions. Can you tell me why you shouldn't resign? There is a process to be followed here. Uh, we've received the inquiry one week ago. And when those questions keep coming... Thank you very much. How much are you going to take? Time for a tactical retreat. From October 2009 to October 2010, Australian officer Gus Gilmore was the commander of ISAF SOF. Subsequently, in January 2011, Gilmore was appointed Special Operations Commander Australia. On 19 September 2013, he was appointed the Deputy Chief of Army to replace Angus Campbell. His final appointment was as Head Military Strategic Commitments Division from 2016 to 2019. He now runs a consulting firm, the Gus Gilmore Group. From October 2011 to October 2012, the commander ISAF SOF was Australian officer Mark Smethurst. He went on to become the commissioner of the New South Wales State Emergency Service. After misconduct allegations were made against him, he resigned. He now runs a consulting firm, Unleash Consulting. From May 2013 to December 2013, the commander of ISAF SOF was Australian officer Paul Kenny. Kenny is currently the commander of Australia's Special Operations Command. The Brereton report alleges there were breaches of the law of armed conflict in 2009, 2010, 2012 and 2013. During this period, at least four senior Australian officers were commanders of ISAF SOF and according to Brereton and the ADF, they had operational control of the Special Operations Task Group. Not only has Defence failed to hold those Australian commanders accountable for the failings and breaches it has identified in its own report, instead, it has promoted those officers to the highest ranks of the Australian Defence Force. Brereton has tried to separate the Special Operations Task Group from Headquarters JTF 633 and has also avoided going into detail about ISAF SOF. However, what is apparent is that Australian officers, both at headquarters JTF 633 and at ISAF SOF, hid operational command and control over the Australian Special Operations Task Group. If the SOTG was under the control of the commander of ISAF SOF and an Australian was that commander, then why are they not held accountable in Australia under Australian law and military doctrine for what happened under their command? Why was this issue not addressed by Brereton in his report? There are three reasons ISAF SOF is not discussed in detail. Firstly, and perhaps most obviously, is that alleging that an international coalition of Australia's allies are accountable for war crimes would likely cause international political issues. Thank you. Over to you, Mr President. Thank you, Boris. And, and I want to thank uh, that fellow down under. Thank you very much, pal. Appreciate it, Mr Prime Minister. I uh, am honored today to be joined by two of America's closest allies, Australia and the United Kingdom. Secondly, because ISAF is an international coalition, it would mean that war crime prosecutions would be heard by the International Criminal Court and would be outside of the control of Australian authorities. A third and less obvious reason is that there were many senior Australian officers working in the International Security and Assistance Force. If the true extent of their control over SOTG was known, those senior officers would be under scrutiny and may not be able to avoid accountability for war crimes because of the level of control they had over the SOTG. This is a paper published in the United States Army War College Journal, Parameters. It's written by Rhys Crawley an Australian military historian. The paper is about the lessons the Australian Army learned from its involvement in the war. It draws upon documents and interviews that Crawley has access to as part of his role as an official historian 
at the Australian War Memorial. Lesson 2. Maintain a selective embed program. A defining feature of Australia's war was the visibility and effectiveness of its embedded officers in coalition headquarters across OEF and ISAF. Anecdotally, it was not unusual to have an Australian in ISAF headquarters briefing another Australian in Regional Command South, both speaking with the weight of their respective coalition commanding generals. American General Stanley McChrystal had Australians spread throughout his headquarters. A two-star general was his senior military adviser to the Afghan Defence Minister. A one-star general coordinated the ISAF security response for the 2009 Afghan elections and another one-star general was a senior intelligence officer. Being a non-NATO member, Australia was able to bypass the flags-to-task ratios and take a strategic approach to select where it placed its well-trained, highly proficient officers. Consequently, the ADF's leadership focused on getting people into positions that increased Australia's exposure to high-level decision-making and theatre operations and then keeping Australians in those jobs so long as it suited national interests. This programme also benefited those individuals, exposing them to significant coalition machinations, personalities and pressures. These few well-placed people often were more visible than the hundreds of troops in Uruzgan. Several coalition generals have spoken in surprise about Australia's successes in this regard and have commented they wish they would replicate that access. Notably, they have also invariably praised those officers. It was a deliberate policy, enabled because of Australia's historic links with the Five Eyes Intelligence Partnership countries that dominated Regional Command South and ISAF headquarters, as well as the performance of those individuals. This selective embed program delivered huge benefits to Australia. Aside from exposing a generation of senior officers to coalition warfare at the operational and strategic levels, it allowed Australia to have a say in shaping the war at the tactical level without having to deploy too many people, expend large sums of money, or put people unnecessarily in harm's way. It delivered strategic bang for the buck, allowing the ADF to meet the government's objective of supporting the United States without undue risk. The lesson, therefore, is Australia, leaning on the reputation it has gained in Afghanistan, as well as its access to Five Eyes intelligence material, should continue to maintain a highly targeted program of embedded officers. This inquiry found no evidence that there was knowledge of or reckless indifference to the commission of war crimes on the part of troop, squadron and commanders of special operations task groups and higher command. However, being unaware of or even deliberately kept unaware of actions, unlawful actions, does not relieve commanders of moral responsibility. Angus Campbell knows, or ought to know, that what he read out to the Australian public on 19th of November 2020 is false. There is no concept of moral responsibility in Australian Defence Force doctrine. This is Australian Defence Doctrine Publication 00.1. It is the primary doctrine regarding command and control in the Australian Defence Force. It is an essential document that every officer must be familiar with. Chapter 6 describes command in combined and coalition operations. Part 6.9 describes the interrelationship between Australian and coalition commanders. Full command, the military authority and responsibility of a superior officer to issue orders to subordinates, exists only within a national force and is retained by CDF at all times. No international commander can exercise full command over ADF forces that are assigned to a combined or coalition force. Full command equates to ownership and conveys with it complete operational and administrative authority and responsibility. This means that the Chief of Defence at all times has full command or ownership over all Australian Defence Force personnel. 
that full command cannot be assigned or delegated to other forces. And importantly, full command equates to ownership and conveys with it complete operational and administrative authority and responsibility. In other words, contrary to what Angus Campbell said to the Australian public, responsibility and accountability does extend to high headquarters. They have, in the words of their own doctrine, complete operational and administrative authority and responsibility. It is clear that higher command is fully responsible, at law, in accordance with their own doctrine, and morally. If commanders of JTF-633 and commanders of ISAF-SOF are not accountable, then who is? I'm probably going to put it loosely in the context of some work that I held the pen for, um, not necessarily did myself, but I held the pen for as we, as an ADF, took a knee after 20 years of uh, Afghanistan operations and an Afghanistan campaign and took a look at ourselves and said, you know, at an individual level, a leadership level and a high strategic level and, and, and asked ourselves, you know, what can we do better? You know, I just think about how good, are, how good is it to be in an organisation that's willing to do that and hasn't always been willing to do that. Um, and we're, we're willing to look hard at ourselves, celebrate the positives uh, humbly um, and, and lock horns with the things that we're not so great at, um, with a commitment to ourselves collectively and obviously to the nation. But yeah, it makes me feel good. I'm glad to be here. Oh,